All right, welcome to Apologetic Showdown. I've got a great guest here, Camille Greger. I hope I pronounced your name right, is that right? Yeah, perfect. You actually did extremely well. All right, thank you. I know in that discussion you had a while back, there was some controversy over that. So That's all right. Get it right. Um, yeah, so I thought Camille had a really interesting, or has a really interesting objection or, or counter kind of um, explanation for the resurrection argument. And it's not, the resurrection argument's not my favorite go-to apologetic argument but just to clarify things at the beginning, but I know a lot of Christian apologists use it. And I think Camille actually has a strong rebuttal to it. And um, yeah, so I'm gonna give kind of what I think is the overview for his argument. And then he'll correct me if I get that wrong or if he needs to add anything. And then we'll just kind of discuss the merits of the argument and see where things go from there. And if this is your first time here, go ahead and click like and subscribe. And um, yeah, so we'll just get started right now. So so I take it that your argument is obviously to give kind of a naturalistic explanation for the resurrection. So one that doesn't appeal to um, God raising Jesus from the dead. So it's not, um, you know, the Christian hypothesis. And I just want to make sure everybody can hear us. Yeah, so Camille concedes that the Christian God, or I should say that you know Yahweh, the God of you know the Christians believe in, exists. Just so I don't make sure I'm not begging the question, and or concedes that that is he'll concede for the sake of argument, and that miracles can occur. But even granting all of that, it's unlikely that God would raise somebody from the dead because we don't see that happening. So it's just a priori, just very unlikely that would happen. So already it's more likely that Jesus was not risen from the dead. And then he can give an explanation for, or theory for the origin of the disciples coming to believe that Jesus was risen from the dead. And this was because they were very convinced by the Old Testament scriptures. And they saw that there were accounts like the suffering servant and they saw that that matched fairly well with the life and passion of Jesus. So then from there, that gave them kind of a expectation to look out for these, um, for a resurrection. And then there was some kind of experience that the disciples had, which could have been seeing like um, a cloud that was shaped like Jesus. And then that gave them, you know, grounds for thinking that that was sufficient enough to believe that Jesus was risen for the dead. So that was like the vision that's mentioned like in 1 Corinthians 15, um, you know, of the appearance. So, you know, you can account for the appearance. You can account for, you know, the expectation of the belief because they believed in the scriptures and the Old Testament scriptures. And then from there, you know, Paul had some kind of um, hallucination as well. And then that accounts for Paul's conversion. So, you know, it's a naturalistic account. And I think the plausibility of it comes from that he doesn't have to appeal to very many types of experiences. So it sounds like you appeal to, you know, one hallucination and then one, I can't remember the word you use, but some kind of um, vision, kind of like seeing Jesus in toast, but like seeing Jesus in the clouds. And then, um, yeah, so Camille will say that that's more likely as an explanation than the explanation that God raised Jesus from the dead. Does that kind of summarize it? Uh, yeah, I, I think you would probably do a better job defending it than most uh, from what I've heard. Uh, yeah, I, I think it, it's important to realize, like, to explain why I'm doing this, right? Uh, because I have to say. Um, looking at the great debate community that atheists usually do a terrible job when they are debating you know this topic or theism in general you could you could for example see it recently in the, the debate uh, uh, that Matt Dillahunty had with um, I never remember who the Christian is um, but the, the, the thing is that when it comes to a re the resurrection it's extremely difficult to pin the atheists down uh, so that they can they actually 
give an account of what they think actually happened, right? Because what what usually takes place is that the Christians give their um, the resurrection hypothesis, basically, which is essentially saying that the uh, New Testament accounts are factually true, and then all every, like all the atheists are doing is just raising doubt and poking holes in the. Uh, let's say the official story right but it's actually very rare to hear someone present and defend an alternative explanation and it's kind of assumed or taken for granted that almost that almost any explanation that you can give is going to be more probable simply in virtue of it not involving Yahweh raising someone from the dead right but i think it's not actually like good enough uh especially if you think implicitly that there are like almost any explanation is uh, going to be better so if you think that okay well can i get at least one alternative explanation right so i thought it would be fun because i'm interested in ancient history anyway to to try it because even in like scholarly literature there have been some attempts to flesh this out uh, they are not very serious. It's not like, uh, you know, atheists are writing or let's say New Testament scholars who are not Christian or don't think that resurrection can be established on a historical basis are like writing books about it, right? That's usually what Christians do. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I think like, honestly, I, I can probably do a better job than most people. So this is what I've got so mm -hmm. far. I, yeah. I've been I've been kind of uh, trying to, to 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 talk to a couple of apologists, honestly, really to to hear their feedback, right? Like at this point, I'm not uh, that interested in like defending it uh, because it could be very well the case that there is something that I missed uh, that causes it to, to like not go through, right? So I had a, a discussion with um, like uh, Junta Junta something like that. Uh, and then with this guy, you know, Kyle, uh, I, I, I'm assuming that's the one that you saw. So, yeah. Yeah, I saw uh, some of the yeah. Blake Junto one. I haven't yeah. finished it because it's like a three hour yeah. video, yeah. but I haven't, yeah. The, the, your debate with Kyle, that was the one I saw all of. But, um, but yeah, I think what's plausible about your counter is that it kind of explains the why the old testament prophecies would match as well and you know from a christian perspective of course i think that they are um inspired but at the same time i kind of have a a different perspective on inspiration than most christians do but that's a different discussion but so anyways that's kind of a merit as well with your hypothesis yeah i, I maybe it's, well there was one thing that you you didn't mention which is pretty important right like so if there's a christian listening to it i think probably one of the first objections that he's going to raise is okay like what about the resurrection appearances in the gospels for example you we, we clearly have matthew the tax collector well, who was handpicked personally by jesus to be his apostle and wrote the gospel of matthew as we have it today who describes you know jesus appearing in galilee on a mountain and like multiple people saw him at the same time and then you know john uh, actually describes people touching jesus and stuff like that right so what's what's going on there uh so it's important to realize that actually the hypothesis just says that early christians believed the old testament to be a historical reliable source of information about jesus right uh so they naturally assumed that Jesus was the Messiah, probably because that's what he claimed. And then they believed that the Old Testament describes what the Messiah will do. So they believe that's what Jesus did, even though he didn't actually do some of those things, right? And then the Gospels, I'm granting, are written in the genre of Greco-Roman historical biography, which means that I'm granting that uh, one of the goals of the Gospel authors was to come up with a plausible narrative of what they thought happened. But the problem is that their uh, sources of information were limited. And one of the key sources of information that they were using was the Old Testament, right? So for example, I think that the narratives of the empty tomb are based on Isaiah 53 verse nine, which says they made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. So what I'm thinking is that the gospel authors mistakenly believe that here Isaiah is talking about Jesus. 
And just like authors of the Greek historical biographies did, they would write a story about Jesus' burial in a rich man's grave, which was consistent with their source, meaning Isaiah. Uh, and then they added some other details based on their existing beliefs, right? So for example, early Christians were Second Temple Jews, and Second Temple Jews who believed in resurrections, believed in physical resurrections that actually leave behind an empty body. So if you are a, an author writing about someone being uh, buried in a rich man's grave, and then that person goes through a physical resurrection, well, the tomb would become empty. So that's what you would write. Uh, and you would then construct like a plausible narrative around it. And we know that like, this is what uh, the authors of Greco-Roman historical biographies did. And when it comes to the appearances uh, in the gospels, that's basically the same thing, right? So I'm thinking that the gospel authors probably knew that um, Jesus supposedly appeared to his uh, earliest disciples. We know there were creeds, you know, circulating around describing this. Uh, but the Greek creeds don't actually give you any details. Like in 1 Corinthians, it just says that Jesus appeared, but it doesn't say where, uh, what was the nature of the appearance. It doesn't say, you know, he appeared and then, you know, ate a piece of fish or people touched his wounds and stuff like that. Uh, so a gospel author who believes that Jesus was raised, believes that he appeared to people and believes in a physical resurrection, would naturally write a story where Jesus has a physical body that multiple people can see, they can touch him and stuff like that, right? Uh, so that's basically um, explaining these pieces of evidence. Right, so it kind of sounds like your explanation in some ways is kind of like Hubbard Ehrman doesn't, you know, kind of argues that Jesus wouldn't have been buried in a tomb, but, and I don't know if Ehrman uses the argument the way you are, but um, drawing upon like, well, this is why Jesus would have been buried in a tomb. I don't know if this is what you're arguing, but it's like, this is why Jesus would have been buried in a tomb because it says it in Isaiah 53, which sounds like it's about Jesus. So they kind of read that back into history. Is that kind of how you're arguing? Uh, well, you have to, explain why the Old Testament matches the New Testament so much, right? And I think it's much more plausible that the reason why this is the case is because the New Testament authors perceived the Old Testament as talking about Jesus in advance, right? Uh, so naturally, when they were thinking about the kinds of things that Jesus must have done when he was on earth, they would go to it as a source, right? Um, so yeah, like when we, if we could, if we saw something like that everywhere else in ancient history, this is what the historians would conclude, right? Like nobody would conclude, oh yeah, that must be because the older source was actually divinely inspired prophecy about what's going to happen in the future. No, like everyone would just think that, yeah, like these people mistaken the older source as a source for the newer one, right? So I think if we just look at, uh, the New Testament as we would look at any other uh, works of ancient literature, which I think we should uh, if we don't want to beg the question and assume that it's divinely inspired uh, scripture uh, from God, uh, then yeah, I think this is plausible. And when it comes to the, like what probably happened to Jesus, I think just given what we know from that specific period in time and region, like the most probable explanation or the most probable scenario is that he would be taken down from the cross, which was according to the Jewish customs, at least as it seems. And he would be placed either in a common grave with multiple people. So they would have like a ditch uh, where they would put uh, bodies of resurrected or of uh, crucified criminals. Or it's now it seems more plausible that given like the latest uh, research on burial practices of crucifixion victims, then they would just uh, dig a trench grave, which basically is just a hole in the ground in the shape of a human body, put the body in and you cover it with dirt. And there you go, right? That's how you dispose of a um, of a crucified criminal, which by the way, meets all of the criteria. Like it, it would su satisfy the Jewish law when it comes to purification of the land, uh, you know, giving a criminal a burial and stuff like that, because th that was regulated in the Old Testament. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard that as well, like from Ehrman. And I know there have been, I haven't read the responses. I know there was a response from, 
That yeah, and I mean, I, I again, I don't want to poke holes in the official story, right, or in, in the yeah. uh, in the gospels. But like the the burial narratives are not very plausible um, as they are, right? Because um, presumably you have Joseph of Arimathea, which I I can grant he was a historical person, right? Uh, you you don't have to like if you think that the uh, empty tomb story is invented, you don't have to also think that he was an invented character, right? Like I, I I'm thinking for example, it could very well be the case that the gospel authors kind of knew, yeah, there was this guy uh, Joseph of Arimathea, who he was secretly a disciple, and he was on the Sanhedrin council. Uh, so when they were thinking about how Jesus's body would end up in the in a rich man's grave, they would would think that this is a plausible way, right? Like, okay, we know there was this disciple, he was very wealthy, he was in position of power. So, okay, he must have been the one who buried Jesus, right? But yeah, the, the idea that you would take a, like, a, because the uh, rock, cut sto uh, rock cut tomb that Jesus eventually ends up in, in the gospels is essentially an equivalent of the Hilton Hotel, right? It was like the, the best, most prestigious, most expensive way how to bury someone available. Uh, that would be available only for someone like a Sanhedrin council member. And mm -hmm. so, so like Christian apologists somehow sometimes try to explain it in very convoluted ways. Like they will, for example, say that Joseph of Arimathea placed Jesus into his personal tomb because it was actually like an official uh the responsibility of the same hindering council members to make sure that crucifixion victims are buried but that directly contradicts what the gospels say because the gospels explicitly say that joseph of arimathea requested jesus's body because he was his disciple and he was awaiting the kingdom of god right so uh. right so yeah that's one of those common like minimal facts that gets argued that like, of course, you know, like the gospel authors wouldn't have invented Joseph of Arimathea. So it sounds like you're granting that he was a, or a real figure, yeah, yeah. but I didn't catch what was the role that you think, or maybe you, you're just agnostic on it, but do you think he played some kind of role in Jesus being buried at all in like the mass grave or... Yeah, I don't think we, we we have any way to know because, like, anyway, you have to explain how why is it the case that Joseph of Arimathea disappears completely from the story, right? Because if you think about it, uh, supposedly he was secretly a disciple of Jesus, and uh, he was like really one of the leaders in Jerusalem at the time. So it's really strange that in Acts, for example, he suddenly disappears. He is not involved in, he doesn't show up, for example, when the apostles are arrested multiple times in Jerusalem. He doesn't, for example, became one of the church leaders, even though he could have, because he was in a very good position to, to become a church leader because he was a person of like power and authority. Um, he, for example, he's not a gospel author, which is really strange. Like if you think about the traditional gospel authorship, you have at least two people uh, as the traditional authors who wouldn't really have the necessary skills to compose an original Greek work uh, as a gospel, right? Uh, because the people who had the, these kind of abilities were usually very uh, affluential, very highly educated and very wealthy. But the perfect candidate for someone like that would be Joseph of Arimathea. And we actually know of people who were authors of history in like a similar position. So we know, for example, about um, Jewish historians in the first century who were part of the official court, like the royal court, which is kind of similar. And some of the biblical commentators are puzzling, puzzled by this question as well. And their solution is that is to say that Joseph of Arimathea probably died soon afterwards. So that's why he doesn't play any role in the events, right? We, of course, don't have any historical evidence, but you have to explain it somehow, right? But to be honest, even if you grant that he was a historical person, then you, we just don't know, right? We don't have any reliable sources for that. Yeah, I think it's uh, maybe, I don't think Mark's gospel makes it mentions Joseph of Arimathea, but I think it's later gospels, maybe not until John's gospel, if I'm remembering correct, if that he's signified as like a follower, a secret follower of Jesus, which yes. I guess somebody could, if they're going to take a more minimalist view, will, could say, well, maybe he wasn't a follower, 
but still buried well, Jesus. I think I think uh, Gospel of Matthew may already says that he was uh, he was uh, a, he expected the the kingdom. Um, and it gives that kind of, I, I, I'm not sure if it says that explicitly, but it's like strongly suggested this is the motivating reason behind it, right? It, but even in the Gospel of Mark, again, if I'm remembering this correctly, it says that he had to muster courage to go and ask Pilate to give him the body, which is, I think, more evidence against the idea that this, it was just him doing his job. Because I, I, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but like um, some time ago, um, Cameron from Caption Christian, and they had two guys on, and they were talking about the resurrection th for three hours. And that, that, like, I'm an atheist, right? But so, like, it's not surprising that I'm going to say this, but like, just as someone who is interested in ancient history and who really cares about like this topic, I have to say that conversation was complete train wreck when it comes to accuracy of information and <clears throat> how it was relayed, right? And one of the things that they argued for is that the reason why Joseph of Arimathea requested the body of Jesus is because he was a council member and this was one of their official duties. But the thing is that, first of all, it's it's like laughable to imagine that these people would do it in person. It's like imagining just because like Donald Trump has some official responsibility that he has to physically do it himself. Like they, they they would obviously have servants for this kind of work, especially when it uh, involves like handling a dead body and stuff like that. And the second problem is that the text actually says that I think in the Gospel of Mark that uh, they uh, he had to muster courage. Which, if this was just him doing his job, that's not something they would have to do, right? It would be just the course of of his like occupation, right? He would have to probably do it with the two criminals who were crucified next to Jesus. So <laughs> what's going on? Yeah. Yeah, I did look it up. Mark 15, 43. Yeah, that he was um, taking courage and waiting for the kingdom of God. So yeah, it seems like it could give that implication that and, the, and the, there is there is definitely some development in the story uh, because I think already in Mark and again I I, I would have to look this up in uh, in detail but I think already in Mark it says that the whole council uh, voted for Jesus to be executed right but then you have a problem because one of the council members is a disciple but then he also voted for Jesus to be killed, right? So what's going on there? And if I'm not mistaken, in one of the later gospels, and I think it's in John, it says that it explicitly says that Joseph of Arimathea was not present when the decision was made. So again, if you are open to this idea of like narrative flexibility and the story, um, you know, like different authors telling the story differently, you can kind of see it as later authors trying to rehabilitate Joseph of Arimathea a little bit by saying, yeah, he was one of the Sanhedrin council members, but he didn't actually vote for Jesus to be crucified. But the problem is you that would contradict the previous gospels. So the way how you can kind of harmonize it is to say, well, he didn't vote because he wasn't there in the first place, right? So technically it's still true that the entire council voted. It's just, he wasn't in there so Technically, like he he didn't participate in the vote, um, so yeah. But I, I think this isn't like uh, that important when it comes okay. to explaining this. I think much more important questions are like why the body was not produced if it was around and stuff like that. Right. So um, yeah, I just want to respond just from my position real quick. So there are some Christian theologians who, and I guess apologists of sorts who would argue that we shouldn't be arguing the resurrection argument. And I would be more in that camp. And one of the reasons for that is that I think like when we look at John's gospel, setting aside historicity, but just looking at, you know, like when um, Thomas wants to feel Jesus's wounds and Jesus says, blessed are those who believe without seeing. And I don't take that, I don't interpret it in a fideistic sense, like we should just believe just for no reason, but rather that um, somebody should already believe in Jesus because of his you know, moral character, because of his you know, sense of authority and so on. And we, we, wouldn't, we shouldn't need 
some kind of empirical proof. And I see the resurrection argument is trying to give a kind of semi-empirical argument for Christianity. And to me, it kind of, to me, sidesteps the fundamental reason to believe in Christianity. Not to say it's disrespectful to give the argument, but that's where I just don't place a lot of stock. And then, of course, I do think some of the skeptical um, counters, at least I can understand, you know, where it's coming from. It's not to say that it's correct. Like, I don't believe in your theory, but I can see where you're coming from as an outsider, you know, perspective. So I just wanted to share my yeah. Yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, um, d d d one of the reasons, again, why why I was interested in doing this is First Corinthians 15, right, where Paul says, you know, if Jesus was not raised, then our fate is in vain, which I definitely agree with. Like, that's probably one of my favorite passages in the Bible, apart from the whole of the entire book of Ecclesiastes. Um, yeah, because, like, I think, uh, you know, it's it's... In apologetics, again, I, I think this is something that uh, Chris, uh, atheists are really bad at, right? Like the usual way how evidential apologetics goes is that you are supposed to first at least establish that some kind of God probably exists, right? You probably want to go with the God of classical theism, you know, outside space, and so time, disembodied mind and stuff like that. And then... Uh, you are supposed to show that, okay, given that God exists and maybe he want, he's like all loving and he's interested in what's going on in the world and stuff like that, it's not implausible that he would like become incarnate and, and uh, it, like intervene in human history. And then finally, like the final, <clears throat> let's say, nail in the coffin is the resurrection, right? So if you already built all of that foundation, then it supposedly becomes convincing, like the idea that the best explanation for the historical evidence is that Jesus really was raised. But the, and I think where a lot of atheists are actually making a mistake when they are thinking about it is they push necessarily uh, against things that they really don't need to push back against. Like they, for example, think that if they dig their heels in early and they start arguing very strongly against the idea that God exists, for example, or that miracles can happen, one well, then then they get no resurrection for free, right? Because obviously, if there is no God, well then there is no one to raise Jesus. But uh, I like. This is something that almost makes me physically sick because then there are discussions that go on for hours and hours just about the column cosmological argument, which doesn't even end with God existing, right? Um, so I thought it would be interesting to... And the, 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 and the, the point is that, that the conversation almost never gets to the end. It always It's always stuck in at the very beginning because atheists are image, like immediately start objecting against everything, right? So I thought it would be interesting to see if you actually concede everything except for the resurrection, if Christians can, Christian apologists can make the final step, like if they can seal the deal, right? So, which is the reason why I'm granting explicitly, even though it's something that I don't believe that Yahweh exists, miracles actually happen, including resurrections. The gospels are written in the genre of Greek historical biographies. So I'm throwing out, for example, the conspiracy theory, stuff like that. I'm, I'm giving like the apologists everything that they want. And I'm just trying to see if it follows, even if you grant everything, that the resurrection is the more favorable explanation. And I think it doesn't. Um, yeah. yeah, and that's uh, where I could, oh, sorry. Yeah. Did, no, 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 oh. I, I mean, I, I think this is, this is probably where I would be like unusual or, or innovative, right? That I'm not interested in arguing if like, uh, you know, miracles do actually happen or not and how often and stuff like that. I just want to see, okay, if, if I grant you everything. Like, does it still follow? Yeah. Well, from my perspective, of course, you know, I'm um, persuaded by Christianity, but I still think that the, so sometimes, so something that kind of bothers me, and I'm not saying this is where you're coming from, but sometimes atheists or agnostics will say, well, arguments about God are just like a waste of time because that's just going to get you to deism. It looks like Pine Creek is leaving a similar comment here. But I think, believing in God is important, even if it doesn't get you to a specific religion. So I do think the arguments about God are important, but also I do agree though, as a Christian, I should get, have some sort of foundation for my belief, but I just, for Christianity, but I don't, 
I just, I can, uh, I've always kind of understood where an outsider, like if I wasn't a Christian, I probably wouldn't be persuaded by the resurrection argument. I think it has some plausibility to it, but I do think a naturalistic explanation can be given and some are better than others. Like the swoon theory, I think is pretty implausible, but like yeah, your type of explanation, I think seems reasonable. It's like, yeah, I could see something happening like that. Like if I, if I wasn't persuaded, like if another religion had this resurrection argument, but I had other reasons for doubting that religion, I don't think the resurrection argument would be strong enough. So Again, for me, it's more about Jesus's character is what persuades me. And I know that that, um, you know, it's going to have people have different intuitions and such. But um, anyways, that was just my two cents there. Yeah. And I, I, again, I, I have absolutely no problem with the idea that God exists. Right. And I, to be honest, I have absolutely no problem with like, you know, Christians being Christians because t- even like there are debates where usually very conservative evangelical apologists who are in this okay. evidential camp who think it's absolutely critical for Christians to be able to give a defense of uh, the resurrection specifically using the historical method, right? Are going to have a debate with a different Christian, also very conservative, who believes exactly the same thing that they do. They just don't think that resurrection can be established with this kind of methodology, right? The, a, a classic example is Dale Ellison and uh, Mike Lacona, right? Like Dale as Ellison obviously is a Christian, believes in the resurrection, everything. He just thinks that this is not the right tool to use. And I massively respect that. Like if you want to be a Christian, it's perfectly legitimate to be a Christian because of pragmatic reasons. Like there are historians who think that, uh, yeah, like they, they believe Christianity is true, but they don't think it can be established historically. You can be a fideist, which is again perfectly fine, right? Like I think fideism has a very bad rap, uh, and it's not. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't really see the reason why, or I don't think it's not that big of a deal. You can be a presuppositionalist. That's also fine. Uh, the like really the only thing that kind of motivates me <clears throat> internally to try to do this are people who are going around saying that, look, the resurrection hypothesis is the best explanation for the uh, historical evidence. All other alternative explanations are completely laughable. Um, There is no other way to explain it and stuff like that. So I'm like, challenge accepted, you know? (laughs) I think Dale Martin is another Christian. He debated Mike Lacona a while back. Oh, yeah. I'm probably thinking of him. Yeah. No, Dale Allison, Allison, I think, is another one who's a Christian, but I think he he argues for a spiritual resurrection, though. So not. Yeah, that's, that's actually very tricky because there is no such a thing as a spiritual resurrection, right? Like the, the Greek is actually pneuma. Uh, It's derived from pneuma, which just means like a very refined uh, material substance. So it's usually a combination of fire and air. So in that conception, Jesus would have a physical body. It would just be made of a different kind of stuff. Um, Yeah. Uh, but yeah, right, I agree. Yeah. I, I agree with you there. I think that's just Dale Allison's point. I haven't just mm-hmm. read his work, but I, I've read that he argues something like that, but could mm-hmm. be totally wrong. Um, but I wanted to add one other category. So you said presuppositionalist, BDS, pragmatist. I think those were the three you said alongside evidentialist. So I take kind of a unique position here, which we don't have to break down and I need to flesh it out more but I take an intuitionist type approach, which most people just write off and they're like, hey, you can't do that. But I think you can. So anyways, I just want to throw that in as another um, category. But I agree with you that in that, I don't think the resurrection argument is, I kind of look at it as like the Kalam and fine tuning arguments. It's like, I get where apologists are coming from, but I don't think they're as conclusive as apologists argue that they are. And of course, I'm a fan of, a different cosmological argument. I think you watched one of my debates, which again, not everybody agrees with me on. Most people don't, but I just I have my own way yeah. of arguing. But uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's not like you know, it, it's important to realize that there are like you know, seven billion people, probably close to eight, right? Uh, at this point, like vast majority of them, almost everyone, already believes in some kind of God. 
probably a vast majority of them also believe in uh, in miracles, like in gods actually <laughs> interacting. And there are even millions and millions of people who believe in exactly the same God, Yahweh, right? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they are still not convinced that Jesus was raised. You know, they are called the Jews. <laughs> so, you know, like it's, you don't have to, like for, for, from my point of view, just if, even if you manage to like successfully convince me of let's say classical theism, you still have like a long way to go. And like when it comes to it's 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 great that you mentioned the intuit intuitionist approach. Like, like I absolutely can uh, sympathize with that because you know when it comes to <laughs> history, and I see it like all the time when I talk to my professors and stuff like that. Um, a lot of these. Um, like as probability estimates in history, like what's plausible, what's more probable than not, what like wh whether one hypothesis is more probable given some evidence than other, that usually comes to intuition as well, right? It's often a very well informed intuition. There is like a massive amount of background knowledge, you know, years and years of reading primary sources and stuff like that. In many cases, it's based on empirical data. So we can say that like something is more probable than something else because we have actual like data that we collected. But it's very often based on intuition. And it's like massively, massively subjective. Right? I'm now reading about the Homeric question, which is just the question of how the Homeric epic came together, like their authorship, the role of oral tradition and stuff like that. And you will see more often than not, that the positions that the historians are taking are not really based on anything very specific because everyone involved has been dead for like thousands of years, right? And the we just have the text. We don't have any external evidence, almost any external evidence. Uh, so yeah, I wouldn't uh, necessarily see the, um, like an intuitionist approach as something that should be like laughed at, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that because, yeah, I see this. Just, I think intuitions actually play a huge role in people's reasoning. And oftentimes I see that with the mythicist debate. So, like, the mythicists will put forward their case, and then the historicists will put forward their case. And it's like, sure, you could argue either side, but I think there's this deep intuition when we look at the, um, the data you know, it, it seems like the most plausible explanation is Jesus existed. But if somebody is really committed to the mythicist position, I think it maybe is impossible to talk them out of that if they aren't going to get on board with that intuition. And that's kind of my perspective with Christianity. It's kind of like I have this deep intuition that given Jesus's character, not even not that all the Gospels have to be totally historically accurate, but just given what we have, it just seems like He's divine to me, but I wouldn't be able to um, get you over to that side. I don't, uh, so anyways, that's just kind of where I come from. And it's not yeah. what most apologists argue. And I think more apologists should argue that way. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's unfortunate because if you happen to be correct and it's true that you can't get me o over to the other side, then I'm screwed, basically. <laughs> well, not from my perspective, though. Oh, I, don't, okay. I think it's based on your relation with God. So while I do think people should become Christian if they see it as true, but I think that God is in his just, so I'm Catholic and the Catholic mm -hmm. approach is more of, um, you know, um, how you respond to what you apprehend as true. So it's not mm -hmm. to say, I would say, oh, you're an atheist. Great. Like you're fine where you're at. I would try to convert you, but I'm not going to say, well, you're not a Christian, so you're going to hell. Or you're a Christian, you're definitely going to heaven. We don't know. It's up to God. So that's my yeah, that, 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 Yeah, that's really interesting because, you know, I'm, I'm in the country which has been repeatedly measured to be the least religious in the world. And the strongest uh, organized religion is Catholic, right? And historically, the country has always been, like, to a large degree Catholic. Uh, so, like, the few... Uh, people that I know who are religious are Catholic. And yeah, they are like fire and brimstone all the way. It's actually really interesting that um, uh, in the US, you know, the, there is this um, there is this stereotype that like Protestants are usually much more, let's say, um, 
I don't want to say like well they are they have much more traditional views right and uh, Catholics are a mo more like theologically liberal but here it's like the other way around right it's completely flipped apart from Pentecostals but there is like a thousand of them I think here um, yeah yeah I, I, what I wanted to say about intuition is that it's a very unfortunate that like new atheism became associated with exact sciences right like you know there is this massive credit obviously that like exact sciences like physics chemistry and stuff like that have in modern society and it's obvious that movements like new atheism want to take credit for that so, so they kind of naturally and i'm not saying any anyone is doing this deliberately it's you naturally feel proud of like the accomplishments of exact sciences you know do you think that this is like the real thing and this is what actually accomplishes stuff but if you are over in like social sciences or humanities you have a very different perspective on epistemology and like epistemic credences and stuff like that you know like when you when it comes to history specifically and ancient history even more than that yeah like our level of confidence in what we know and like how we know it and why we think it's probably true should be very, very low. So that just means that intuition plays a much bigger part in you know how people think and when, why they have the, the conclusions that they have. So yeah, again, I probably wouldn't disagree very much. Right. Well, I think intuition is perhaps the strongest piece of evidence because ultimately, <clears throat> excuse me, ultimately if you ask somebody enough why they believe something, you're going to hit a sort of, I, I think, a foundational block. And it's going to be based on, well, I just have this strong intuition. And I think that's perfectly fine if the person really apprehends it that way. I just, yeah, I think intuition gets this bad rap. We should break things down as much as we can. But I think we're going to hit that roadblock. Like I'm, I use the example for, um, I'm really convinced that I have free will. But they're, ultimately, that's based on this intuition. I, I feel my I experience myself having free will but if somebody else says they're really convinced by these determinist arguments i can respond to them but if they don't get on board with this intuition i'm probably not going to convince them they have free will even though it seems to me really obvious i have free will so that's kind of an analogy yeah but on the other hand i also i also <clears throat> see like why the apologists who want to argue that you can establish the resurrection as the most probable given the historical method like what they are interested in doing that because they are also like they also want to take credit behind the like the the historical method right like they think that if this is true it should be provable like it should be or demonstrable just like any other claim in history right so and because this <clears throat> is the methodology that we are using right now let's try to use the same methodology to to, to do that so i'm i completely understand where 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 they are coming from i just think that like if i adopt the same like a lot of the same starting positions like you know got existing and stuff like that and i actually use the same methodology because when it comes to the methodology i'm literally just copying from like william william craig michael Lacona. you know they, they all go to the same guy anyway there is like a one uh, historian christian historian who wrote a, uh, a methodological textbook about investigating the past and this is when apologists rarely reference someone they reference him uh so yeah i just i'm just copying is this that. habermas or no 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 no. this is a cb and mccullock he is completely unknown because he's not an apologist. He's an actual like uh, historian, and he wrote a textbook. It's uh, called "Justifying Historical Descriptions," okay. and it's just about how to do history. It's not. It, it has nothing to do with Christianity or the resurrection or anything like that. It's, I, I think just because he's a Christian, when apologists, you know, you, when you read, you know, William Lane Craig, for example, and he gets to talk about the resurrection he starts by explaining what the argument of the best explanation is what are the uh, explanatory virtues like uh, you know a lack of organized explanatory power possibility and stuff like that and uh, so when you go through these uh, works of apologetics it usually goes back to this one textbook for example Mike Lacona uses him and it's actually super super spicy because um, this guy CBN McCulloch 
wrote a review of Mike Lacona's book, uh, The Resurrection of Jesus, New Historical, Historiographical Approach. And Lacona was using him for methodology and McCulloch in the review criticized Lacona for using his methodology poorly. And he actually said that he, even though he's a Christian, he doesn't think that the resurrection is the best explanation and that he's a Christian for pragmatic reasons. So it's like super spicy. Imagine if you are, if you write a PhD thesis and then the person whose methodology you're using writes a negative review, right? It's like a really, I think it's really embarrassing at some level. So yeah. Um. Well, it could be, but and again, I don't have a dog in that, but it could be that, you know, Lacona, I think somebody could take somebody else's theory and go in a different direction with it. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I happen to agree with him, right? Like, I think that like Ona isn't uh, using it um, correctly. I agree. It's 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 it, the biggest problem is plausibility because, of course, um, you know, if you just look around the world, you see that Yahweh has a very strong tendency not to raise people from the dead. So if you are supposed to explain something, and one of the explanation is an actual resurrection. And the other explanation is something different that we see people have doing all the time. Well, then the resurrection explanation is going to be inherently very implausible. So you will need really good evidence to overcome that. The problem is that Lacona says, okay, uh, we can't establish, well, like if um, the, the resurrection is really implausible on naturalism, but I'm saying that God is a really good candidate for a resurrection. And if resurrection is true, uh, 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 if God exists, then all bets are off, right? Like we have literally no way of knowing how plausible a resurrection would be because we have no way of investigating whether God would be interested in raising someone or not. So uh, like my explanation doesn't actually fit the criteria of plausibility, but it doesn't fail it either, or at least we can't establish that. So that's fine. But this is really ridiculous. Like, of course, we can investigate what Yahweh does and doesn't do because we can observe it every day, right? Like if Lacona was correct, if I take this uh, cell phone and I put it down, I can predict with almost perfect accuracy that in the next hour, Yahweh is not going to decide to cause a miracle, a send, the f send the cell phone flying across the room. And if Lacona was correct, I would have absolutely no way of telling one way or the other. It would be literally 50-50, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, I imagine Lacona would argue, you know, that there's, because I think like Swinburne argued, like if there's some background knowledge of given Jesus's moral character, it makes it more likely and, you know, the messianic yeah, yeah, claims yeah. and such. Yeah, exactly. This this is actually uh, this is actually one of the like if you are interested or if like an, uh, an apologist is interested in um, defending the resurrection like historically, I think this is the most important aspect to focus on because I think honestly it's the weakest link, right? Because if we just look around the world, just like we see that Yahweh usually doesn't send uh, cell phones flying across rooms, we have very little experience of that. So probably not a very plausible explanation for something. We see that, you know, he doesn't raise people very often. So, but of course, there are many, many arguments for why he would make an exception with Jesus, right? But the problem is that if you actually look at all of those arguments, they usually either uh, are circular. So they presuppose that Jesus was raised. They are ad hoc, which means they invoke things that are not actually in evidence or they are non sequiturs, which means that even if the thing that's specific about Jesus was true, it doesn't follow that he would then got raised, right? Like those are two th things that have nothing to do with each other. It's It would be like saying, you know, if I have to parody the argument, like, Jesus liked uh, ice cream, therefore he's the kind of person that uh, Yahweh would raise him, would raise from the dead, right? Like the two things don't have anything to do with each other. Uh, so. Like I think apologists would, should probably do most work in this area, like really come up with uh, at least somewhat convincing reasons for thinking that Jesus would be an exception. And of course, Christianity can tell a story uh, about why Jesus was the one person who got raised and other people don't. 
right? I can tell you the story as well, right? It's uh, to a large degree the content of the New Testament. But the problem is that any, anyone can just uh, tell the story. Uh, you have to show that the story is probably true and you have to, and this is the tricky part, show it independently from showing that the resurrection probably happened. Uh, because otherwise, again, it would be circular, right? It would be saying, okay, Jesus was probably raised because he would be the kind of person that God would raise. And he would be the kind of person that God would raise because he was raised. Uh, and I don't think <clears throat> that you can do that with the available evidence. Right. Well, and that's kind of where... I guess I, I'm taking some heat in the, the side chat over here, but that's kind of where I come from, that if you're convinced enough by Jesus's character, then you kind of don't need the resurrection argument. And it's not, I want to clarify, it's not that I'm denying Jesus's resurrection. It's, our, it's do we have a strong historical argument? And I think if you're already convinced, then you really don't need the resurrection um, apologetic argument. But I agree, in order to get to the resurrection argument, you do kind of need to be convinced of Jesus's character. Because like if I was if I was repulsed by Jesus's character, I would thereby doubt the resurrection because I would think, well, no, that just wouldn't have happened. Or if it did happen, that's not what God is endorsing, or you know, because yeah. I don't believe in Jesus. Like, you know, there are other religions who make miracles. So I think we're on the same page there. But. Yeah, I mean, it's for all we know, <laughs> like if if if, you know, Jesus's character was repulsive. It could have been like a satanic deception, right? Um, because if you think about it, um, convincing people to worship, convincing the Jews specifically to worship a man as a god is exactly the kind of thing that Satan would want to do because that means you're breaking the first commandment, right? You are becoming an idolater. So uh, that's a very good point. And yeah, like well, one of the one of the the um, arguments or one of the things that are supposed to show that Jesus is the kind of person who would be more likely to get raised by Yahweh more than just random people is his moral character, right? So apologists, this is for example, what Blake uh, tried to do. Um, apologists will say something like, okay, Jesus is, is uh, like a moral, uh, a paragon of moral virtues or something like that. Therefore it raises the prior probability or the plausibility that he would be raised. Now I, I understand this is not what you're saying, right? So you go right, from like, the, Blake, someone like Blake would go from moral character to higher plausibility of the resurrection, to then uh, high probability, like final probability of the resurrection because of all of the evidence, right? Uh, and uh, for, like for me, this is one of the arguments that don't really click, right? It's it's a non sequitur. It doesn't really follow why someone who is a moral character is more likely to be raised by God, uh, especially, and this is really spicy, so I'm granting that uh, miracles actually do happen, and I'm granting that resurrections actually happen, which means I'm granting there is an actual data set of resurrections that we can investigate. This is something that you will not hear any other uh, atheist say. So if you pick up, for example, Craig Keener's uh, massive volume on miracles, I'm granting some of those miracles are actually real, which, mean, which means we can investigate them. And we can kind of see if the arguments that are supposed to raise the plausibility of Jesus's resurrection also apply to these other resurrection cases. And what do you know? The other people who were raised, supposedly, were not paragons of moral virtue. They were just normal people, you know, like eight-year-old girls in Africa and whatnot. So why am I supposed to think that being a moral, good moral character is, is increasing the possibility of the resurrection, right? right? Well, I think, I guess, I'm imagining argument would be moral character and sort of messianic claims kind yeah, of going together. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Well, the, 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 then, then what you're essentially saying is that, okay, it's not really moral character. It's also, it's actually something else about Jesus, right? Which means that Jesus becoming a, a, a paragon of moral virtue becomes redundant as an explanation. Really what you are after is like the, the, the special souls, the, the, the thing that Jesus, makes Jesus unique. And I think, Honestly, like if, if 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 apologists were honest, they would say that it's um, you know Jesus' divinity, and all of the other things like him leading a sinless life, him being a paragon of moral virtue, and these kind of things are just um, 
essentially like manifestations of that divine nature or like a byproducts, right? So it's not really the, the reason why Jesus was raised and not other people who we, who we would consider to be paragons of moral virtue is because Jesus is the only one who has this X factor. And if that's the case, this is the thing that we should focus on. But then the problem is how do you actually establish that Jesus was divine independently from the resurrection? Because otherwise you would be begging the question, right? And again, I don't think it's uh, this can be made, uh, this can be done be by, uh, using the historical method. Because you have to remember that all of our evidence, historical evidence for Jesus being divine, is contained pretty much in the Old Test in the New Testament. And the New Testament was written by people okay. who already believed it. So of course they would depict Jesus as someone who Yahweh would raise because they believed he was raised and they would do it even if they were mistaken about it. It would be very weird if uh, the gospel authors, for example, wrote something like, okay, Jesus was a terrible person, but Yahweh decided to raise him anyway. You wouldn't expect that, right? So even if they were mistaken about Jesus being raised, they would still depict him as someone who was worthy of being raised. And that's the reason why I think there isn't any evidence that would motivate us uh, believing that Jesus would be the kind of person who Yahweh would raise independently for uh, from us thinking that he actually was. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say, um, you know, that X factor would be, um, and again, I, I base it on intuition, but it's that, from my perspective, that the, the character of Jesus transcends the what the authors would have written like and again it's based on intuition i just get that impression so and i don't and some people might say oh well i'm just grasping for straws i don't think that i am because actually um i really seriously question whether christianity is true for myself and that is the argument that that keeps me around and if i was talked out of that or convinced out of it i would i wouldn't be a christian but that's just yeah, where I, I come I'm from, definitely. Right? I'm not definitely not going to talk you out of that. That's not my. Uh, not oh no, I know. I'm just. Yeah. I'm just sharing that more from the people. Well, no, no, you that's, and anybody, that's all right. So people that's know right. where I'm coming from. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I mean, this is fair, right? Like, it's it's being very honest and transparent, and it's refreshing, right? Because you can kind of see. I've seen many, many uh, argue, uh, many, many, you know, discussions and debates and stuff like that, where you are running around in circles, uh, um, talking about historical evidence for like okay. an hour and a half, and you are going really deep into individual like details about the the burial practices and about the responsibilities of the Sanhedrin Council and like some minute details of the timeline of acts and stuff like that. And after an hour and a half, when everyone is already exhausted, the the the, the person who is you who are you talking to will suddenly start bringing like completely different reasons which I think are very often like the real reasons. So, you know, they will start bringing up like uh, how Christianity uh, transformed their lives, uh, how they have like personal experiences uh, and these kinds of things, right? So I think it's, it's um, refreshing if the people are very like honest and upfront about um, what they believe and why. And also think it's very important uh, and I appreciate like you saying, okay, if uh, someone convinced me otherwise about this, then I would reconsider, right? Because I obviously, I have a great response to the question, what would convince me, right? Uh, because I think that's, a, that's, a, that's a, uh, an answer that anyone should have. Uh, so like what would make me much more confident just that Jesus was raised? Uh, and I'm not talking about something happening today, right? Like uh, miracles happening in Jesus and his name and stuff like that. When we just go with the historical evidence, so uh, we have um, manuscripts from the first century, the ancient manuscripts from the first century, where we actually know for sure that they are from the first century and they that they were not tampered with, they are the original. And that's because they come from Herculaneum, which was a city that was covered uh, when uh, Mount Vesuvius erupted, right? So Pompeii was covered by volcanic ash, but Herculaneum was actually covered by like a mixture of lava and uh, seawater. 
which made it completely like um completely uh like isolated and completely uh yeah like it, it preserved everything perfectly including organic material and we actually found a house with first century manuscripts it's mostly a greek philosophy like epicureanism and stuff but it's possible like at some point because not all of the scrolls have been uh investigated that there might be some christian material even like that so if something like that can happen in italy it's possible uh, something like that happened uh, in other parts of the world that had absolutely no contact with the Mediterranean. For example, Mesoamerica. So we know that uh, in the first century there were Mesoamerican civilizations. We know they had writing. So it would be awesome if we discovered a first century manuscript covered in volcanic ash so that we know absolutely with, like, like with great certainty that it comes from the first century and that like nobody forge it or anything like that uh, depicting jesus appearing to these people giving them essentially the gospel and explaining the uh, to them like write this down this is going to be important later and us discovering it today like if if that uh, was the case then that would be a great piece uh, in a cumulative case for the resurrection and it would like increase my confidence Wait, in the sorry but basically. what sorry i spaced out just for a second what would the text say yeah, it would basically like uh, um, narrate a an appearance uh, of Jesus to Mesoamericans, and he would basically it would just say like this guy appeared to us. He explained that he's the son of God, that he lived uh, like uh, for thirty three years in the other side of the world, and then he was like he died, and he's supposed to do it because that accounts for our sins. And now he's appearing to us and he's uh, instructing us to write this down and like put it in this temple next to uh, a volcano uh, because it's going to be important at some point, right? And I, again, I, it's very important to say that I'm not expecting us to actually ever find this. Uh, I'm just saying that this is the kind of thing that if we had it, would massively increase Marco, my confidence in the resurrection. And, you know, if Christianity is true, it's not like it's difficult for Jesus to arrange for this kind of evidence to exist, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just like, a, let's say, yeah, uh, like my answer to the question, uh, what would make me much more confident? All right. Um, yeah. I'm going to go through some of the questions and comments, <laughs> if that's all right, unless you had something else that you wanted to add. No, probably not. That's fine. Okay. okay. Um, let's see. There was a number. I'll try to hit the ones that looked like they were objections or questions of some kind. Let's see. Okay, there's a lot of what's going on. And okay, so SJ says. This doesn't account for, so she's talking about your theory, this doesn't account for the decades of preaching under extreme persecution by the apostles. So how do you respond to that? Yeah, that, that's a great question, right? So uh, when it comes to things like transformed lives of Jesus' disciples, their eventual martyrdom, the spread of Christianity, the shifting the main day of worship from Saturday to Sunday and stuff like that, all of those pieces of evidence can be explained equally well by Jesus' disciples having a sincere but mistaken or false belief in Jesus' resurrection, just as well as them having a true belief. And uh, like all my hypothesis does is explaining where that sincere but false belief in resurrection came from, how it formed, right? So it just covers the ground zero. And then everything else, like the, the whole of history of Christianity, goes on exactly the same way as Christians explain it. Because you have to remember there are historic Christian historians who actually specialize in popularity of Christianity. Like why is it the case that Christianity became popular and some other ancient religious systems didn't? Like Judaism, for example. Like why is it the case that you know millions and millions of Greeks and Romans didn't suddenly become Jews very quickly? And if you actually write, read those books, and they're like massive volumes, and you open it, it doesn't just say, oh, Jesus was raised, right? Because Jesus' resurrection 
doesn't actually explain it. It's a necessary condition, but you have to say more about it. And if you read those books written by Christians about it, it goes into very complicated arguments about the political situation, about the culture, uh, like cultural, social, and economic structure of the Roman Empire, what kinds of people became Christians, where, and stuff like that, right? So you still need to make a lot of arguments, even if you think that Jesus was already raised. So the only thing that my explanation or my hypothesis is, does is explain where that initial belief came from. Yeah, I think that that's a plausible response. Yeah. Given the explanation. And then SJ followed up with they had zero extrinsic motivation to lie. So I imagine you're going to say they weren't lying, they were mistaken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah, this is very important. Like, I'm, I'm not uh, saying <clears throat> that anyone lied to deceive people, right? Uh, I think that's actually fairly implausible, even though, you know, you never know. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I think like they, honestly, sincerely believe that Jesus was raised. Uh, it's just, uh, I'm explaining how is it that they became convinced of this, even though it actually didn't happen. So yeah, uh, th this is not the, the conspiracy hypothesis or something like that. All right, and then SJ had another one. That's wrong. Corinthians explains Jesus's physical form. So I think this is about the cloud formation based on the context, but. Yeah, yeah, so like, uh, yeah, sure. So w when it comes to, to the appearances, there are basically two bodies of evidence, right? There are the gospel appearances, and then there is the first Corinthians 15. So we already talked about the, the gospel appearances, and then there is the first Corinthians 15 creed, which I'm granting, you know, that, that this is, for example, that uh, Ehrman probably doesn't think, like he doesn't think that first Corinthians 15 is goes back to the Jerusalem pillars, you know, Peter, James, and John. But I'm granting that like the reason why he Paul uh, narrates it is because this is what they told him when he met with them in Jerusalem. Right? So we, this is actually like a historical record of a real experience that these apostles and then 500 brethren all had at the same time. The, the, the thing is that in 1 Corinthians 15 in the Creed, it doesn't actually tell you any circumstances. It doesn't tell you uh, when it happened, where, uh, how much time elapsed between these individual experiences, right? It says, you know, he appeared first to Cephas, then to 12. But does it, it doesn't say like he appeared to Cephas on Monday, and then five weeks later, he appeared to the 12th, or uh, five minutes later, you know, uh, which, obviously uh, opens it up for all kinds of naturalistic explanations, including explanation or including events that multiple people can see at the same time, you know, because um, when it comes to, for example, the hallucination hypothesis, the obvious weakness is that hallucinations are private. So they are in the minds of the individual and they cannot be shared between groups of people. But the hallucination isn't the only thing that's on table, right? So I'm out of all of these possible explanations, I'm just picking one, which is pareidolia, and that's a human tendency to incorrectly perceive a meaningful uh, a, a stimulus as a meaningful pattern. And you see that in many religions, not just Christianity, all the time. Uh, so I'm just using that. It's true that if you ask Paul, hey, Paul, do you think that Jesus was raised in a physical body? Paul would say yes. And if you ask him specifically, hey, Paul, do you think that Jesus appeared to Cephas, the 500 and so on, in a physical body? Paul would say yes. But what I'm arguing is that the reason why Paul would say yes is not because Jesus actually appeared to people in a physical body. It's because Paul was a Jew, second temple Jew, who believed in resurrections. And people like that universally believe in physical resurrections. So what uh, explains Paul talking about Jesus having a physical body is not Jesus actually having a physical body after the resurrection. It's Paul's existing beliefs, right? And I have a great analogy. So imagine someone says, I, see, I saw an alien spacecraft yesterday. What explains his belief? Is it more likely that the explanation is him actually seeing an alien spacecraft? Or is it more likely 
that the explanation is him seeing an unusually bright planet Venus and already believing that there are aliens visiting Earth? I think the second explanation is much more probable, right? Because we know that people who already believe in aliens, alien abductions, you know, aliens visiting Earth, we know that these people have a tendency to conclude that an experience of something else other than an alien spacecraft was actually an alien spacecraft, right? So analogically, I think it's plausible to say that a second temple Jew who already believed in physical resurrections would be likely to explain something like a pareidolia as an appearance of a divine being who was resurrected in a physical body. Because, you know, that's what was already part of their worldview to start with. Okay. So I think, and I'm going to have to fly through this because I actually had to go in a couple of minutes. But, yeah. okay, so writer John Buck, I think you would respond similarly. So you said, are miraculous explanations intrinsically the least plausible um, explanation for an event? Um, real quick, how would you respond to that? No, uh, uh, definitely not. I think you can imagine even more, or even less like plausible explanations, right? So there is nothing, uh, I, I'm not actually, uh, I'm not actually uh, basing my low estimate of plausibility on the resurrection being a miracle. I'm basing it on natural theology, which is the branch of theology that allows us to learn about Yahweh just from observing the natural world. It's, for example, the foundation behind the fine-tuning argument. And, you know, if we observe the natural world, we can learn that Yahweh has a very strong tendency not to raise people from the dead. And if you have two explanations, one of them involves something that we know from experience Yahweh almost never does. And the second one uh, involves something that we see people doing all the time. And then that second explanation is much more plausible. All right. And then, John Buck, this is kind of a little bit off topic, but how would you respond to C.S. Lewis's trilemma? So was Jesus liar, lunatic, Lord? How yeah, that's a great question. So we, we have a lot of other people who claimed, claimed to be a messiah in the first century. Um, so how would you exp how would you answer for those people, right? Like, were they liars, lunaticals, or lords? And I think uh, this, like, however you answer that, the same answer is going to be applicable to Jesus. It's just, the only difference is that Jesus was the one guy where his followers were able to explain away why he was killed because they went to the Old Testament and they became convinced this was part of God's plan from the beginning, right? So I guess in fairness, just to back up the argument a little bit, I guess somebody would argue that other messianic figures maybe didn't claim divinity. So the argument is specifically about divinity. Now you may question if Jesus historically claimed divinity or you know if that could be explained another way, but I think that's how like a defender of this argument would fire back. Yeah, I, I mean, we don't actually know if the like these other people claim divinity, right? Because you have to remember, for all these other figures, we don't have, well, more than four gospels written about them because their religion didn't become popular, right? For various reasons, maybe they didn't uh, tell their disciples to convert other people because their worldview was like exclusive. They didn't think that the point is to convert right uh, to, to be evangelistic um, so we don't actually know like imagine if we didn't have the gospel if Christianity was didn't become popular for example Paul wouldn't convert and Christianity would eventually die out would just become one other you know second temple uh, Jewish sect uh, then probably the New Testament either wouldn't be written or it wouldn't be preserved and if the only thing that we would have about Jesus was something like testimony on Flavianum assuming it's authentic as we have it today. Well, they, we wouldn't, for example, know that Jesus identify himself as a son of man. So we don't actually know if these other Jewish religious figures made the kinds of exalted claims as Jesus did. Well, so, I guess yeah. somebody, maybe I, we need to have another episode where this could be debated, but I guess somebody else could, the person could fire back saying, yeah, but we, those people maybe weren't as morally impressive either and so on, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. sure. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the next one now. So 
Pine Creek says, is it more likely that God would raise Jesus because of his moral character? What about the many resurrection claims in Craig Keener's books? Are they more moral? Um, I guess that's more directed at me. And I would say yeah. that, well, I haven't read that, but uh, that book, but um, yeah, I would say that they, it's not. So I guess when I say moral, I mean that there's something extra authoritative about Jesus's personality. And, and that would say but that's you get what not the question valid, you what the what you get what the question is asking right because like yeah you if this is the if it's the case that the thing that gets you raised is having this special property then we should expect other people who are raised to have that property as well the problem is if you think that there are actually resurrections going on the people who get raised don't have it which means you shouldn't think that it's having this kind of property that gets you raised, right? Right. Um, right. It's not having the property. I guess that, in fairness, somebody could argue those people weren't making messianic claims, but it could get you back into the, the original um, issue you were talking about earlier. About I, I guess my I guess I could imagine somebody saying it's moral character of a special sense that only Jesus is found to have and messianic claims, something like that. But anyways, I imagine that somebody would argue that. Well, but. yeah, well, I mean, so, so what, you, what, you're, what, you're making, what you're doing right now is like you are making Jesus more unique. But what you should be really doing is trying to find something that all of the people, including Jesus, who supposedly were raised, have in common. Because that would be the thing that uh, that would be the reason why Yahweh decided to raise them and not someone else, right? Um, so, what is it that Jesus has in common with some like ten-year-old girl in Africa? So he was raised, and she was raised supposedly. If you grant that these are real resurrection cases, yeah, like just th th think about that, right? Like, uh, right. Yeah. Well. Okay, so the way I would respond to that is so I'm going to respond to this next question. So did God raise Lazarus, the child daughter? Were they perfect people? This is from Pine Creek. It's clear that God raises people who have sin in their life, but still very rare. So I do want to make the distinction, which you may not grant. that often time, So there's a difference between this resuscitation and the resurrection. And from the Christian perspective, it would be only Jesus and possibly from the Catholic perspective, you know, Mary as well would be the only individuals that have been resurrected, although others have been resuscitated. So resurrection being the idea that you're raised to immortality. Yeah. But and I, I, do, I just want to make one note. Yeah, this is a very important distinction, and I agree. And so if I, I, this is not what you're doing, but if there, there are apologists who try to raise the plausibility of Jesus's resurrection by arguing that there are other resurrection cases. If, for example, Craig Keener, like the whole point, and he says it explicitly in the book, the whole point behind his book about miracles is to show, look, there are other instances where we think miracles happened and there are very good historical documents backing it up, which means the idea that, she, that a miracle took place uh, around Jesus' death and he was raised is not very implausible, which is fine if you want to argue that. What you shouldn't then also do is to say that actually Jesus' resurrection is of completely different kind. It's not a, a resuscitation, it's a resurrection. Like you can't have it both ways, right? Like either you are saying that Jesus' resurrection is a member of a same set as other instances of a resurrection, or you are saying it's a unique member of a set on its own, apart from other instances of resurrections, right? So again, uh, this is not what you're saying, so I'm not criticizing you. Just want to throw it out there, right? That's, I feel some, sometimes apologists want to have it both ways. and want to say, yeah, Jesus' resurrection is very plausible because it's one of many that we can establish is probably true, but it's also completely unique because you know no one else was um, ascended to heaven afterwards, and everyone else just went on and died eventually and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised actually. Apologists would argue that because sometimes it gets raised. Well, what's special about Jesus's resurrection when? There are other individuals in the Old Testament. And what I always hear exactly. is, well, Jesus was the only one who was resurrected. And then it's like, 
So I'm surprised if there are people appealing to an idea of other resurrection that um, I guess there are, but I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't argue that way. Um, okay, I do got to wrap it up, but there was, that, that got through the questions. Pine Creek did have this for me, and there were some others raised in this as well. The problem with using intuition is that intuitions of Mormons and Muslims say their prophets are correct about the text. Yeah, I grant that other people can use intuition for different conclusions. So somebody said, well, what about like flat earth and so on? Intuitions can be revised. But at the end of the day, I think that whatever our foundation is, so I'm talking about foundation, I'm talking about the foundational epistemology of what seems most plausible, I think, is the set of views that we should adopt. So if I find it most plausible, I'm gonna still go with it, even if somebody else claims they have different intuitions. Now, how do we get over that hurdle is difficult, but that's just how I would at least defend that. But, yeah, and yeah. I, I just, just want to say very quickly about that. Um, so uh, if there are atheists watching this, they are probably infuriated because I'm not pushing back against you at all, right? And it's just because you're such a nice guy and we basically don't have anything to argue about. But if I wanted to be like combative and uh, like try to push back against what you're saying, then yeah, I would like, I hope it's obvious to everyone that this is the route I would go to, right? Like I would point out that yeah, intuition, like you, you can justify basically anything by appealing to intuition. And si sincerely, right? Like people have sincere conflicting intuitions about all kinds mm -hmm. of things. So probably intuition is like a, not a very good justification for holding beliefs. <laughs> yeah, but I want to push back on you though, because earlier we did agree that there are a lot of, that beliefs do kind of ground yeah. out to intuition too. So sure, yeah. we may not like it, or we may want something better, but I think at the end of the day, a lot of our, our beliefs do kind of funnel down to some intuition. Yeah, I don't yeah, think yeah, sure. that's a problem. I think yeah, sure. Just well, what we have. This, is, this is kind of like a glass half full, half empty kind of situation, right? Like what I'm saying, yeah, it's true that it's very often comes down, comes, comes down to intuition. But what we shouldn't do is to kind of throw our hands in the air and say, oh, then who cares, whatever, right? <laughs> Like, well, yeah, I agree with that. I think, though, that there you go, we agree. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just yeah. want to clarify. I think intuition is a good guide. So I'm seeing a lot of comments in the chat, like, oh, that's ridiculous, and so on. I need to maybe flush it out some more, and that's not what this mm. topic is about. But I just disagree with this widespread assumption that there's something wrong with intuition, because by intuition, I don't mean a feeling and I don't mean a guess and just like an apathy. I mean, it just seems like at the end of the day, that's your most uh, most plausible um, summary of the data to your mind. And different people will have different, um, you know, epistemic um, judgments. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there was one other question. Spartan says, does Camille have any more debates lined up? I'd like to hear him defend this against someone who really understands his approach. Do you have uh, any other debate? Yeah. Uh, not at the moment. I send it uh, to one guy who recently had a discussion with uh, with um, uh, Tom Jump, but uh, I don't think it's going to go anywhere. But if you actually want me to talk about this, find an apologist and like uh, set it up. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, because, if anybody's, yeah, yeah sir. Yeah, yeah, if anybody's no, I, watching, yeah. if you want to, if you want to debate Camille, I can host it on here. Um, I'm sure there are other people that are a bigger channel. Or just like, um, get on, but. yeah, I, I actually wanted to 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 ask you if it would be possible for you to, and I, I will give you a link to like an online version of the paper because I have like a ten pages overview of of the explanation. If you could uh, post the link to it to the video description afterwards. And you know, if there are people in the audience who want me to talk more about this, then feel free to grab the link and share it around. And if there are like apologists and whatnot who are interested in talking to me, because I'm sure there are Christians who will probably think that there, you know, apologists would, uh, it would be very easy for them to to refute it or to like raise substantial objections. Then then please do that. Like either you yourself or reach to other apologists that you know and ask them to, to look over that. Because honestly, I'm just looking for feedback, not not uh, trying to make money or not trying to just, uh, you know, 
have like arguments and and discussions and stuff like that. I, I honestly want to know what is people who are you know doing this uh, as as their job basically, or at least feel very strongly about it. Have have to say. Yeah, yeah, and that's my approach too. So yeah, I present. There's a couple of arguments I present in debates, and yeah, I, I find my arguments plausible, but I uh, amend them all the time. So it's not that I'm. And I, yeah, and exactly. I see that in you as well, that you're, um, you know, we're trying to flesh out arguments and. Yeah. And if you, yeah. And if you, if you notice on the paper, it says version 0 0.8 at the moment. Uh -huh. And that's because I have actually taken like a constructive criticism on board and like uh, I you know, changed some of the aspects of the explanation because I realized, yes, some of the, the points were actually very good. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah, again, if it, I'll post the link, Camille, and then if there's anybody, because yeah, I'm not the guy who's going to defend this argument, but yeah, the yeah, resurrection yeah, argument, fine. but if somebody out there wants to have a go at it, um, absolutely, I'm not, um, I, I want to host that if they want to be on here or somewhere else. So um, let's see, Spartan said, I like to check it out, have a discussion, not as much as a debate, but a discussion like this. Yeah, discussion is fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I don't oh. actually, I don't actually think formal debate works very well for this because it's basically like, um, yeah, I, I have no problem just uh, giving a quick overview of the argument for the audience that haven't read the paper. But then, uh, yeah, like if, if I, I'm perfectly happy to be basically criticized for you know, an hour or two uh, doesn't have to be like, a, you know, rebuttals and cross examinations and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Pine Creek says there's nothing wrong with intuition. That's that's great. Pine Creek. I'm glad we can agree. Of course, he said the key to figure out is when our intuition is incorrect. I, I agree. I mean, yeah, searching for undercutting defeaters and so on. But sometimes um, it's hard to find those. And again, a different discussion. But um, I do got to wrap it up, but was there anything else that you wanted to add? Uh, yeah, I, if it's if people are interested, I will be hanging around for like an after uh, after show in a Discord server, academic biblical criticism, and I will just post the link to it uh, to the site chat. All right, and uh, then I just posted a link to a book. So Matthew Ramage is a guy like. I haven't um, read this book, but I think he's an apologist who argues that we shouldn't be arguing the resurrection argument um, if somebody wants to check yeah. that out. But okay, yeah. I, I can't do it because it doesn't allow me to paste uh, links. So can I really quickly send you the link to the Discord uh, um, e yeah, email? Sure. If, you, if you can just uh, copy it in this chat. Yeah, I'll try uh, to do it. Yeah, I'll be I'll be hanging around for like a, I don't know an hour. So if if people are interested in talking to me or anything, uh, I mean it, it's it's a great Discord server anyway. Uh, there is a lot of resources and like smart people hanging around. So you should be in there uh, anyway. Yeah, um, I haven't got yet. I'm just curious. Are you um, like a um, history student, or I'm, not yeah, that it matters? Uh, I'm just wondering. Uh, uh, it's that, yeah, that's a great question. So I have a full time job and I have a two year old, but in my free time, I actually started studying uh, ancient history and ancient Greek philology because you know college is free here, so I'm interested in it. The department is like 500 meters from my office, so why not? You know. Yeah, that's kind of how I am. Yeah, I have a job. I'm just interested in um, exactly. Yeah, and, and yeah. The, the the good thing is that I actually have like a I have a an opportunity to get a, a formal education in this eventually if it works out. It, it's been extremely demanding to you know like um, go to work, you know, uh, forty hours a week, and then study uh, basically overnight. But uh, it's it's great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I know where you're coming from. <laughs> Yeah, mm. it's hard to keep up. Being, I'm, you know, being a non-scholar and trying to still keep up with some scholarship is a challenge for me, at least. But you know, I enjoy doing it. All right. Well, I did post the link to your Discord. I'm really appreciative that you came on. Love to have you back on again at some point. Um, if somebody's Absolutely. people are watching, uh, please click like and subscribe. I'm trying to get this channel to grow. 
and anybody ever wants to come on for a discussion or debate about these types of things, you know, just send me a message on here, or Twitter, or somewhere. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you very fun. much. It was a very edifying conversation. Even though I'm not a Christian, I do consider you a brother. All right. Yes. Likewise. <laughs> All right. Well, I thank you, and I'll see you guys.